Melissa Bonzek, and welcome to episode 75 of Books Cubed, the show where I chat with authors you should be reading. It is Thursday, August 27th, 2020, and I got a great show for you today. We are talking horses. I have two authors on today, Laura Hesse, who writes Young Adult with Horses, and Carly Cade, who writes Romance with Horses. And we're going to get right to it, and I'll see you after. Hey, I'm happy to welcome Laura, and I've got Carly with me both today. They are equine young adult writers. It's a genre I did not know exists. So they write about horses and young people, right? And it, are they romances or or uh, uh, mysteries? So I'll let so, Carly go first on that one. Thanks, Laura. So so I write equestrian fiction, and it's actually equestrian romance, and it it leans older young adult adults. Uh, so, and the horses are the primary part of the story. There's a, they're as important to moving the story forward as the human characters are. So it's a story where the horses are as important as the humans. <laughs> I like that. I like that. Let me read bios real quick before we get too far. Mm -hmm. Laura left big city life to pursue a career in forestry after graduating as one of, as one of only 10 women in a sea of over 150 men in 1982. Wow. She was one of the first two women to be hired on a Halitac crew in the province of Alberta. When an outhouse became a luxury item, Laura knew it was time to move on. Same here. Yeah. <laughs> While her passion is still horses, her beloved fjord mare, Pumpkin Sally and Paint Stallion Adapatch have now passed over the rainbow. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, but their spirit lives on in the pages of Laura's novels. Yeah, I have the same thing. I, I've lost my dog, but she lives on in my cozy mystery series. Uh, yeah, that's I had a great right. You just have to with pets. They're, yep. they're family members. Yep, they mm -hmm. are. And yeah. Carly Cade is an award-winning equestrian author and host of the Equestrian Author Spotlight podcast. Creative writing makes her, makes her spurs jiggle. <laughs> good. She writes fiction about horses, horse shows, Western pleasure, and a handsome cowboy or two. Her books are for people just like her, crazy about reading horses and cute cowboys. Carly's novel, inspired by the equestrian lifestyle, is an Equus Film Festival Literary Award winner for Best Western Fiction and has earned two Feathered Quill Book Awards in Romance and Adult Book Offering Animal Categories. Wow, congratulations. Thank you. So, so welcome both. So, okay, so now we know what they're about. Thanks, it's, thanks it's, for having us. Oh, you're, you're welcome. Thanks for coming on today. So how did you, I mean, it's not, it's not something I think, I'm going to sit down and write a book about horses, horses and kids. What made you, and I know you're both horsewomen, it sounds like, but what made you lean toward writing about this subject? Uh, for me, it's, it's, it's been a love since I was a kid. I grew up in Ottawa, uh, uh, you know, in a typical middle-class family in, in Ottawa. And I just, I was in love with horses from an early age. And I was very fortunate. My mother was a professional dance teacher and choreographer of music hall theater. And there were so many different types of people involved in the theater. Uh, and there was a lady there who happened to have a farm that boarded horses. So she said, come on out. And that was it. I've got to meet the horses there. And before I knew it, I presented a financial plan to my dad that it was cheaper for him to let me buy a horse and own a horse than to keep paying for riding lessons. And uh, he said, okay. And I was 12 when I got my first horse. And uh, he said it was the best thing he ever did because it kept me away from boys until I went to college because I was too busy either riding, mucking out the barn or going to shows. <laughs> That would be true. That'd be true. My daughter, uh, as a teenager from 13 on, volunteered at a wildlife rescue. So that's what she did. All of her spare time was at the rescue. And so I, I, she never was in any trouble. I never had any issues with her. <laughs> Worked great. <laughs> yeah, you, I, I, always, I always tell people horses are the best investment for a young woman because they teach responsibility, integrity, empathy, and it keeps them away from the boys because all you want to do is be with the horses, <laughs> riding and being at the horse shows. I don't think I was interested in boys until... I had uh, late college. <laughs> <laughs> me too. <laughs> but, yeah, but for me, uh, writing equestrian fiction kind of grew out of my love as a young person of horse books. Like I fell in love with uh, The Black Stallion by Walter mm. Farley, you know, like all the traditional horse books that young people read. But as I grew older, my love of horses was still there, but there wasn't 
that much uh, equestrian fiction for adults. There are a lot of Western romance novels that are, you know, pretty sultry and often the equestrian facts aren't exactly correct. So I kind of wrote the book that I wanted to read as an older adult uh, with the romance, the handsome horse trainer, you know, the story of a woman rediscovering her roots around horse ownership, uh, kind of a Bridget Jones, like stumbling around trying to figure her way, um, falling in love at the same time as, you know, learning about horses and evolving with a horse and the human horse connection. So, so that's why I went the route I did. You know, there was a lot of dressage, a lot of jumping books uh, for, for young adults, a lot of rodeo, but there wasn't a lot that uh, was in my realm, which is the, the competitive horse show world. So that's what I wrote about, what I knew and what I wanted to read. Hey, yeah, so, for, for me, it was sorry, always the children's books. Oh, sorry about that. So, uh, for me, it was always the, the children's books. But I always found for me the children's books, I love to read them right through into my teens. Misty of Chautauqua is one of my big faves, the, the Black Stallion, uh, all those series. But I kind of found that they, they were set in their world at that time when authors were writing. And we were dealing with so much in the world between the internet and things coming in in such a faster paced world. And I wanted to write a, a story for a child that's emotional and more what they're dealing with sort of in the now uh, with families moving here, moving there, uh, you know, going through so much economic crisis and, and the upheaval of, of children and families going from rural to city and back and forth again. And that's what started me thinking. And then when I met, uh, um, I met this little pony that my, my girlfriend used to work as a groom for one of the biggest uh, jumper trainers uh, on Vancouver Island. And she competed at Spruce Meadows and knew all the big people that were in the Olympics competing for Canada, the US. And I was the groom's groom and I used to travel with her. And uh, we were asked to look after this little pony who had come into Vancouver from Wyoming, you know, named Frosted Tip. And he was a little frostbitten Mustang with broken off ears. And he was, uh, he, he was cute, he was so homely, and a real serious attitude to him. And we looked after him for two days and then he was gone. His family from uh, up north in northern uh, BC came and picked him up and away he went. And I just thought that was such a fascinating story about this pony that it actually continued with me. It inspired me to start writing a book about it. And it started as a short story. And then it merged with my volunteer work with therapeutic writing. And all of a, all of a sudden, this whole series came to mind where I'm dealing with, with handicapped children uh, or handicapped adults or handicapped teens and their world and horses and what they're dealing with emotional, their families are dealing with, they're dealing with. And that's how the holiday series on what I originally started with uh, came to be. So it was a real roundabout thing, but it all started because of a love of, of horses and wanting to see children brought into that world who may not have that opportunity. I like that, I like that. Um, wait, do, you, do both of you, when you sit down to, to craft a story, do you consider? I'm going to disappear for one minute just to shut my window here. Oh, <laughs> Parking the dog, dogs yeah. And contractors. Oh. Oh. Oh, well, wait a second. I'll just cut that part. Okay. And then we'll come back. <laughs> the woes of being a podcaster. I know. Yeah. Yesterday I was trying to record the intro and outro. No, Thursday I was trying to record the intro and outro to last week's show, and my mowers came. And so I had to wait two hours while they <laughs> mowed the yard and then edged all around. And they seemed to spend the entire two hours outside my office. Right, sure. Two I know. walls with the outside with this office because it's the far corner of the house. Like, oh, jeez. Mm -hmm. How it always goes, especially when you're ready to sit down and actually get something going. <laughs> I know. I, I wanted to get it. I thought, I'm going to get it done quick. And then at one o'clock, I, I, I work on a Zoom from mm -hmm. one to six right Eastern on. every day with another group of writers and we write together every day from one to oh, six great. and it's been great. I've been finishing so much stuff and I was all excited about getting the podcast done in the morning so I could write in the afternoon and it was just a wasted day. I lost the whole thing. 
So let's see, uh, and I'll go ahead and cut back to us here. So when you sit down to craft a story, do you consider a series or do you like to work in standalone ideas? Either one of you. Well, I'll let Carly answer first and I'll kick in here. Okay. So, so for, for my books, my, my first book in the reins, I actually, I never intended, I've always enjoyed creative writing and I, you know, always was writing and creating poetry and I always carried a journal around. So I never really intended to publish a book or be an author, but this story just showed up like lightning out of nowhere. I have no idea where it came from. And I, one day in my journal, I wrote the entire beginning of in the rains and I wrote the complete end of in the rains. I think I sat there and I wrote for <clears throat> hours and I didn't know where this burst of inspiration was coming from. So at that moment, I wasn't planning on it being a series. I just was like, what would it be like to explore a first book? What would it be like to sit down and write this thing? Do I have it in me even? And then by the time I got to the end of in the rains, the characters just were not finished with me. And I, I realized at the end of that book, Oh my goodness, this is going to become a series. So now, so now I start, you know, now I'm writing a series. So it's three books deep right now. It's uh, In the Rain, Cowboy Away, and Chopin Promise. And I'm actually working on the, the fourth installment right now. And it's been really fun to write a series because I just, I'm kind of a discovery writer or a pantser. So I let the characters lead me. They, they kind of take me where they want to go. I have a loose idea of the beginning, the middle, the end, and how it's going to wind up. But they kind of take me through the, through the series. So they're not finished with me yet. Uh, so, so I have been working on a series and uh, I like a series as an author too, because I like to read book series. I like to, I'm a binge reader. So I like to, you know, read a story, really get into it, stay with the characters and then go on through the series. So, so I'm kind of writing what I like to read uh, and what I like to read about. <laughs> yeah. How about you? How about you, Laura? Uh, I, it's funny. My, the holiday series is the first series of books that I wrote and I wrote them for children and young adults. Um, and I planned on having all standalone stories and I call it the holidays because they're all based on themes. So I've got the Christmas, Halloween, Easter, Independence Day, Canada Day is a joint one and Valentine's Day. So I planned on them all being individual standalone books, but as a using the specific holiday as a story and that didn't quite work out that way i did when i wrote the one frosty christmas which was my first book and i i uh, had sent it out to regular publishers and i had a wonderful response and i said you know we really love this story but it's too niche market it will never sell and then my parents said to me, you know, Laura, you've got all this business background and marketing background. Why don't you publish it yourself? So I thought, okay, that's a great idea. So I, I, I got some help, you know, from, from people who, who teach, who taught courses and get started. I wasn't foolish enough to get involved with the Vanity Press. I found someone who worked as a editor for a mainstream magazine who helped authors get started and what they needed to know to go forward. And I had 500 copies printed of One Frosty Christmas and the next and I I called up my local craft fair that was a really big Christmas show and said do you think you could squeeze me in? I'd like to see how this book uh, goes. So they gave me a little four foot by four foot table and they scooted me under a water fountain with my little table. Jeez, and I had my books and I was standing in a corner with my one book <laughs> looking terrified. <laughs> and there was an author across from me with 15 books who came over, put his arm around me and he says, honey, I'm gonna teach you how to sell at a, at a trade show. Just watch me he said, for the first day, and it was a four-day show. So I, I, he, he says, just go get a cup of tea. So I sat there with a cup of tea for the first eight hours of the show and watched him. And the next day, I thought, okay, I'm ready. So I developed a pitch. And then I realized once I started talking to people about my book, I didn't need to. And in the first two days, I sold out of the 500 copies. Nice. And I had standing orders for emails and phone numbers for a thousand more books. 
Wow. And the people, and some of the people went home because it was a four day show. So I had to be there the whole four days, even though I'd only had one book left to show people. And I'd already put in an order, rush order for more, uh, to, so people could have them for Christmas uh, with the printers. And they went double time, so I had the books. And I delivered a thousand books by hand before Christmas from that oh. show. And, I th and people were getting back to me, said, we love these characters so much. So I ended up doing a trilogy. So The Great Pumpkin Ride and A Philly Called Easter are the same characters uh, that were in the one frosty Christmas because people love them, love them so much. So it was, you know, and, and it was the same thing. I never had thought of doing the series. I mean, this was now, uh, this was 2003, 2003. So it, it was 17 years ago. And I went, wow, so this is, this is how you do it. And I never looked back. I went full-time publishing for seven years. Uh, and I just, uh, I wrote this six books actually in seven years because I would spend six months of the year uh, writing and six months of the year I was out hoofing it doing uh, uh, artist shows, book shows, book signings at craft fairs, markets. Uh, <clears throat> I was down at BC Ferries uh, for five summers and I sold, uh, I was doing 100,000 a year for five years in print book sales on my own with, you know, my little booze. And, uh, and I discovered it. So I, it was great. I had the chance to run into the editors at, at three different publishers who turned me down. And they saw me out at a show with my books and they said, Oh, how are you doing? And, and I said, Well, I said, I've, I've sold 20,000 copies of this one, 15,000 this one, 7,000 in this. These are the two new ones. I'm only at about 5,000 each of those right now. And I said, and I am on Amazon now because eBooks were st just starting to come out and their mouths drop. And I said, yeah, not bad for a book that wouldn't sell, eh? <laughs> so that was really, you know, that was pretty cool. <laughs> that is fantastic. I've never yeah. heard someone doing that well with one book at a show. Oh, it, it's that one book, One Frosty Christmas, is, is the cornerstone of my publishing company. Wow. And I write in different genres now because I wanted to branch out. Um, but those, the, the five books in the holiday series are, uh, ha, are really in my heart and will always will be, but especially the One Frosty Christmas. Yeah, I wanted to touch too on something that Laura said is often, you know, thank heaven for independent publishing because often traditional publishers, a lot of us who write about horses uh, in the fiction, in the fiction realm, or even the nonfiction realm will, will pitch traditional publishers and they will tell us it's too niche, it won't sell. But I, I think it is, it, I think publishers don't understand the power of women and people who love horses. There are so many of us, but it's, if you're not immersed in the culture, it's hard to actually know that, you know, because like, as you said, you, you're like, I haven't even heard of horse books before, but there is a population of people who are rabid about consuming equestrian fiction. Yeah. 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 The, and you know, um, yeah. Publishing, publishing houses, they don't, they've been very slow to embrace the digital world. And it's, it's a real shame that not too long ago, I think it was like last year sometime. I've kind of lost track with COVID. Uh, mm. But last year sometime, there was um, an author, a very famous author, <clears throat> excuse me, and they gave away one of his books for free. It was an ebook. They didn't have links to anything in the back. Oh, wow. Yeah. What a waste. Yeah. What a waste. Uh, because they didn't understand how to market an ebook. Yeah. And, and they're, they're so slow to do it. It's crazy. It's crazy, but yeah, the, the whole, I used to be a literary agent. It would make me crazy when they would say, there's no market for that. Mm -hmm. no, well, they follow, no. they follow patterns, right? You know, it's like, yeah. what is mass culture consuming now, right? You know, and yeah. like, and then there's these patterns of books that are released and, you know, but they're in the business to make money and, you know, what sells big, what sells fast, what will sell the most coming right out of the gate is, you know, the philosophy with, with any of these things. I used to work in um, the music industry, so I kind of, <laughs> understand how these big distributors work and you know what they're looking for so it, it yeah. makes sense <laughs> yeah yeah it's just it's crazy it's crazy to, 
I have to say one of the nicest things that, that happened was I, two, of the, uh, two of the publishers asked, asked to buy me out uh, when they met me, when they saw my sales numbers. And I showed them, I could pull it up, I could pull up the spreadsheet and show them my numbers for, for uh, the five years that I was really work, really out there and doing signings everywhere. Anybody where I was in schools, I was all over Vancouver Island, I was in Vancouver doing school readings. Uh, shows, traveling. I was doing readings at uh, tax stores and uh, I did it in, uh, uh, down into the Northwest States, uh, Alberta, BC, and on the road all the time. And, and uh, they asked to buy me out and I said no, you know, because I'd run into, uh, I started running some self-publishing courses because I wanted to help other people get started. And I, I'm not going to use her name. She's a New York uh, Times bestselling author of uh, fantasy now when she took my first publishing course she's taken it to a whole another another level she's sold millions millions of books and people don't realize a lot of time that a lot of the best sellers on amazon and the new york times best selling lists are independent publishers and they foo food them but, but times have changed Writers are business people now. They're not just an author wanting to write a story for mom and dad or, you know, the family. They are mainstream. They're very, very mainstream. I've run into authors who wish they were started self-publishers who are with publishers because I make 10 times their income. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm a new author. I've only been publishing for three years. I only have four, four books. Well, I have ten, uh, eight Eight, not, I do nonfiction also. So I think I have eight or nine. <laughs> Forgotten now. I'm working on another one too. Um, where am I going with this? Uh, what were you just saying? <laughs> <laughs> I was saying I that, math. That ah. Independent authors are mainstream. Now. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, oh, and I just lost it again. Oh, brother. It's that kind of day. Uh, and I they're think, making more money. Oh, oh, I know what it was. So often you say that you are, and I don't like the term self-publishing. I like indie publishing because yeah, I agree. they self-publishing people yeah. imagine that you have 5,000 copies of one book in your garage and that's just not the case. And mm -hmm. they will poo poo. And I was at a lunch once and, and I don't make that much money. Uh, I'm, I'm still only high three figures, you know, three figures only, but still I, somebody was talking about how one of the girls was going to pay for lunch with her, with her, with her uh, quarterly, check from her book from her publisher and i i wasn't even thinking i said i said oh uh, how much is that and um she said how much it was nice and, and without even really thinking about it, i said i make more than that in a day <laughs> i felt really bad saying that but i thought <laughs> yeah you know and, and i had warned these people all the time i said i used to be a literary agent i can tell you you will not make any money you will do all your own publicity publicity you will do all the own marketing. You will do everything yourself. And if you don't have a book that catches fire in those first two weeks, they will shelve it and they will hold on to your rights for years and you will not get them back. It is not worth it. Yeah. Self, uh, you know, indie publish. Don't, don't I want to call it self-publishing. Indie publish. That's the word to be. But, but so often, yeah, you say you're an indie publisher and, and they just kind of go, oh, yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, no. The indie world is amazing now. And you're right. I, I have uh, USA Today bestselling authors on the show all the time. And they mm -hmm. are indie published. And yeah. they do very well. Do very I, well. I think that's so interesting, too, because if you think about an independent musician, indie, indie music, independent film, it doesn't get, you know, independent publishing and independent authors are on the rise because we now have the power of the tools to be able to do this and do it well and release a product into the world that is really spectacular, right? So it's like, I, I equate independent authors with indie musicians, indie um, film, right? Because what happens with in the music industry is the a &R people look for these indie musicians who have built their fan base, who have sold a lot of records, who are packing stadiums, and then they sign them on for a big contract if that independent musician wants to go that, that route, you know, but then there's the conversation of retaining your intellectual property. That's why I like to be an independent published author because I can do whatever I want with my intellectual property, with what I created. I can do audio, I can do eBooks. I could, if I wanted to look at what it would be like with film and TV rights, you know, I have that power. I don't, I didn't, I didn't sign it away to someone inside of a contract. 
Yeah, and that's smart. And, and if you do, if you are an author who is listening and you are interested in going the publishing route, make sure that each and everything is a separate contract, mm -hmm. ebook, paperback, uh, hardback, um, audio, every country, everything is done separately. I, I see so many people that sign away every single right, yeah. every single right, plus the right of first refusal. It's like, no, 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 because then you can't even start a new series while you're waiting for your, your rights to revert back to you. It's just crazy. It's, it's, yeah. I, I just shake my head every time I see an author say, well, I want to go traditional. I want to go public, you know, sell a, a traditional one of the big publishers in New York. No, it's just, it's not wise. Not wise at all. No, no, I, I see that. Like I've got uh, 14 options under my belt for film uh, now. And it started actually with one frosty Christmas in a chance meeting at BC Ferries where I met the uh, head buyer for a major film company in Vancouver. And uh, she, grabbed my, she grabbed my book and we had a quick chat as she was running to the ferry. And 48 hours later, I had a phone call with a, an offer for an option for film nice. uh, for it. And it was just, I mean, that was just fluke and out of the blue uh, because I was out, out in public chatting basically. And, um, on, and it was actually at that time, it was between uh, Heartland and myself, my, my work. Wow. Uh, <laughs> Heart, yeah. Heartland, Heartland is like the bomb of a, yeah, and of it was, a equestrian and, TV show. Yeah, so this is how long ago it was. It, it was, they were, uh, had, were negotiating with Heartland and the film company came in and proposed my work. And at that time, I only had, had, the two books I had uh, Frosty and I had Pumpkin Ride and I wasn't on Amazon or anywhere but I was in bookstores all over I I had 375 uh, retailers uh, in Western Canada and the Northwest states carrying my my novels and so I had a, a really good far you know I had a really good uh, following I had a book with reviews of about a thousand reviews that people had given me that, that, that I kept. So I was able to send that to the film company in a synopsis. Now the screenplay wasn't written. It was going to go to, to the screenwriters at the film company. And, uh, but I mean, just, I was so honored to be at a pitch. You know, they were, somebody in the business was pitching my work, this little independent author from Vancouver Island. And uh, obviously it didn't go ahead. They went with, with Heartland because Heartland already had a big audience and a huge following. Uh, as a business manager, I would have made the same decision without question. But it merely made me realize that I had a lot more opportunities and control because of how, what I did and not going with an agent, not going with a publisher as you know, you've just said. And so I, I studied screenwriting. I took uh, screenwriting uh, workshops at UBC with some really well-known uh, screenwriters. Um, I got involved. I did some online courses. I did a playwriting course at my local university to help me understand dialogue. Uh, uh, you know, really understand dialogue and how you're listening to it, how a character would speak. And it really helped me with my writing. I write completely differently now because I took a screenwriting courses and I took playwriting. Yeah, you know, I, I hear, yeah, I, I hear that recommended a lot. And uh, yeah. as a former screenwriter, yeah, I would say that that definitely helps you with your dialogue. Uh, you yeah. have, when you write a screenplay, you have, it used to be 90 pages in my day. Now I yeah. think somebody said it's like 120. Oh, I hate going to movies that are over an hour and a half. Yeah, uh, they won't but in my day, but they'll cut it down. Yeah, my <laughs> day it was 90, 90 pages and you have, yeah where every single word that you put on that page has to advance the story forward. Yeah. With a book, you, I, I, that's why I like books a little bit better because you have all that space to work with. Your stories as long, your book is as long as your story is. Yeah. When you write a story, your book ends. Now mm -hmm. with the screenplay, you either have to stretch or cut uh, if your story yeah. isn't quite there, uh, which sometimes we find out when we go sit in the movie and think, yeah. wow, you know, this was not, <laughs> this, mm -hmm. I've, I've been to a couple of movies that were short stories turned into films and yeah. thought, Nah, they should never have done this. Not at all, not at all, not at all. Yeah. So, so with COVID going on, <laughs> lovely COVID, we've all been trapped in our homes. How many months now? It's August, I think since March. 
since mid-March. My mom's my mom lives near me. She's in a nursing home, and I think they shut down on the 15th, and then our state shut down pretty quickly after that. So what, how, is that, I hate to say COVID has helped my career, but it kind of has because it's made me sit at the computer and I write every day with a group in the afternoon. What has COVID done for you or affected or, or helped your career by keeping you at home? <laughs> well, it, it, it stalled, it stalled mine, to be honest. I'm really hands-on in marketing. Um, I do okay. I do okay on Amazon. Uh, I, but to be honest, I love getting out to markets when I can get out there. I love doing author readings. I love going to writers groups and you can't do that anymore. And my, I, my brunt of my sales, especially with the equine novels is print books. So when I have the opportunity to get out and, and talk to people, talk to kids about their ponies, you know, talk to people about their love of writing, whether it's in, in equine, romance, you know, children's, young adults. Um, I, inevitably, I sell a lot of print books. I, you know, like I can go out to, a, I can go out to a trade show and I can sell 1500 print books in uh, five hours. Oh, nice. Nice. How about, how about for writing? That. I can't, I can't do that on Amazon. For writing, <laughs> you know? for writing, has it kept you in your chair? Are you writing more, you think, in the last few months? Um, it, it, well, yes, it has. But what I've done is I've taken the opportunity. Um, and because I grew up a backstage brat in music hall theater, and my partner is a musician. So we have a home recording studio, not in my office here, but we have a home recording studio. And, you know, we have about $50,000 worth of gear in the house and 23 guitars, I think we're up to now. Wow. <laughs> and, <laughs> uh, so I'm really lucky. So I've actually, in the last year and a half, I've been studying voiceover work and narration. And I have a little children's fantasy series, unicorn series that I have out that I narrated and they do really well on Audible. Oh, nice, nice. My equine, oh. my equine series is out on Audible as well, and they do really well. But I had, uh, I hired narrators, uh, hired, hired narrators for those, and they did a wonderful job. But I want to start doing, I have seven other books that I wrote that are adult that I'd like to record myself. Uh, yeah. So I've started working, doing my voiceovers and perfecting my voiceover. And I'm just starting to record um, uh, my, other, my other adult novels that I wrote. So I've kind of taken a, a little side tour into voiceover and narration uh, right now. And that's really keeping me going for a little change, yeah. Oh yeah, that's nice. And audiobooks are big too. They're getting bigger mm -hmm. every day. How about you, Carly? What, how has COVID either helped or hurt your writing career? Well, so, COVID has been, uh, you know, while it's very uncertain times and it's been very difficult for, for people and, and you're not sure what's going on, I, I've, been, I've used this opportunity to be very, very productive. So I am um, writing every day and it feels so nice. I, I think one of your um, questions that you sent over was, is writing exhausting or exhilarating? And what I've found is, Thinking about writing and the guilt of not getting the words on the page exhausts me. And then when I just sit my buns in the chair and I get into the, the flow with my characters, I'm exhilarated, right? So it's like this, this teeter-totter, this ebb and flow between the two. So I'm using this time to get a lot of writing done. But what I've also done uh, during the pandemic is my big thing is Authors Unite. I really like working with other authors. Laura is one of them, other equine authors. Uh, so what, what I've really done is uh, with my podcast, but in addition to my podcast, I've been building bridges between other authors of course books and looking at creative ways that we can do things online to support each other during this time. So we, we've done a few like really interesting collaborations. One, I'm part of a box set. It's the, it's the first of its kind equestrian fiction box set for adults that includes eight full-length novels and what's really interesting about this box set is we named it horses hearts and havoc because it's suspense mystery and romance for adults who love horses so there's nothing like this out there which is really exciting it just went on pre-order 
uh, and it will be releasing in October. So right now you can snag it for 99 cents, which is amazing. And it's hit a bestseller list. On, <laughs> it's hit a few bestseller lists on Amazon, which is really an exciting project. And all these authors are uniting and collaborating, working together, and we're all marketing it together, which has been fun. And then we've been doing a lot of news, newsletter swaps and discounting our books for our readers right now to give them some escape. And we've all seen lifts in our sales by partnering. So my, my whole thing is other authors are not my competition. When we work together and support each other, we lift each other all up. So, so that, that's been really fun. Fun part of COVID is the collaboration that that's been coming out of the, the time spent behind yeah, the chair. You no, know, you're so right. And I, I, I remind readers, readers, I remind writers of this all the time. Other writers are not your competition. Mm -hmm. If people bought only one book and every other author out there is your competition and you're your own competition, if people only bought one book, but they don't. Mm -hmm. And I know you see studies all the time that say most people never finish reading a book after they've left high school. I think that's bull. Yeah. I absolutely do because book sales are crazy. People sell tons of books. People sell millions of books and who's buying them. It's not five people. Mm -hmm. You know, I think these, whoever they're, they must, it must be polls where they, you know, interview 10 people and then decide that each person represents 20,000 or something <laughs> silly like that. Uh, but no, they're, they're, all the books out there are, are not competition. They are going to be ways for uh, authors to f eventually find you because uh, say somebody reads your book, Carly, and then you do a box set with Laura and then so they discover her or mm -hmm. you're on a podcast and you talk about Laura and then, then they go and they check her book out. And, mm -hmm. you know, as, uh, as readers, I mean, we're readers besides writers mm -hmm. and we're always recommending, I'm always recommending yeah. other books. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. And yeah. the power of horse lovers is always running oh, in the yeah. back, running in the background with the equestrian, uh, you know, genre, you know, whether it's nonfiction or fiction, like uh, if it's got a horse in it, or a horse on the yeah. cover, I'm picking it up. So, yeah, me too. You know, so uh, we share readers. We really do. We share yeah. readers. Yeah. So, yeah. so let me I, ask I, you I'm, I'm a Carly Kane fan, by the way. I have in my <laughs> I, I have a new office, and I haven't found my box of books yet. Uh, and I, I haven't gotten to her, 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 the, her the rest of her set yet, but it's on my to-do list for this winter. <laughs> <laughs> Laura, it's thank fun. you for being a reader and supporting yeah. my author dream. I appreciate yeah, and that. I mean, I, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I love reading Carly's books. I've read other Western romance. It's not something that I write myself. It's what I read for escape. Mm. Uh, you know, so like there's all different things. I love cozy mysteries. I'm a real huge cozy mystery fan. Uh, and I and I started writing them and having fun and, and and but they kind of have a farm life appeal appeal to them because I veered off because of the people that I was reading and the people a lot that I'm reading I'm I'm reading because I saw their covers on Facebook in one group or the other but I, and you know and read their blurbs and went I want to read that and it's the same with with equine books um, um, I've ordered a couple of other books that I saw because I'm on Facebook and I, you know, was speaking to the, uh, the author and, you know, heard about their inspiration for writing this book or, or doing this series. And all of a sudden it's like, yeah, I'm going to go there. I'm going to read that. Uh, you know, and I yeah. just give you an idea. Like I live on Vancouver Island in BC and I think the last count there's 375,000 horses on Vancouver Island. Wow. So that's 375,000 people who own horses that love horses. That doesn't include all the kids and all the adults who go riding, who, you know, who, who are involved with their children with horses. Like that's just my little tiny corner of the world. Multiply that by North America or the province and you have millions and millions of readers in your genre that people consider small and niche, but it, it's because they don't realize how large it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, you know, all those people out there, yeah, who, who love the book. So, so Carly, you had mentioned that every time you see a book with a horse on the cover, you pick it up. Mm -hmm. So as a writer for equine, I want to say it right, for equine, <laughs> either romance or, or the kids version, there's certain expectations, what the reader comes to you. So do you find yourself thinking, I don't want to write, I don't want to have to put the happy ending and I don't want to have to put some of the tropes that, that are expected. Do you want to try to 
right around them or outside them, or are you going to follow exactly what your readers expect? Uh, you know, I, that, I want to write a story that my readers will lose themselves in and something that, that I would like to read. So I, I don't really follow any format or genre. I, I, as I said, I'm a discovery writer. So I kind of wind up where I wind up with the goal of where I want to, want to wind up. Now, I do love a happily ever after, right? That is, that is something that I love in, in my stories and in my books. So eventually that does come, right? But, but my, what's important to me is getting the facts right and creating characters that people can relate to, creating, you know, the handsome horse trainer that people can fall in love with, you know, and have those <laughs> butterflies in their tummies like that's that's what's important to me is just delivering a really good story with the horse facts right <laughs> yeah yeah how, how about you laura um i some books i write to trope um because i find because they're necessary but sometimes the story or the characters take over and the ending mm -hmm. that i have planned is not the ending that comes out in the final book Mm -hmm. um, my prime example of, of, of the two is uh, in Independence. When I started writing it, it was a, a story about a fragmented family trying to come together. And it's, and I called it Independence. It's my Independence, Joint Independence Canada Day book was my theme. And the major theme of it was strong, independent women. So I have a 15-year-old surfer chick from California who gets sent to live with her grandmother in the mountains in the interior of BC for the summer because her mother doesn't want her there anymore because her mom and the kid are clashing. So she just shoves her off uh, to her grandmother who she hasn't seen in 10 years since she was five years old. And she's a really, she's not, this isn't a, it's not a teenage story about teenage angst. It's about a girl being forced into a situation where she doesn't want to be, but strong enough to make the best of it. And she ends up in this incredible circumstance of, and her, her grandmother's crippled with arthritis. So she has a driving team of horses. And all of a sudden this surfer chick is learning how to drive a team of fjords how to how to uh how to cut cattle you know how to ride a horse how to drive a horse and she's forced to make life altering decisions the ending that i had written um because of what was happening between the two women and i used my experiences working as a forest firefighter i brought that into the story for the action adventure and sometimes, as everyone knows, especially with what's going on in California right now, there's not a happy ending. And I felt in this story that it deserved not to have the happy ending Walt Disney ending. It needed to have the ending of a, emotional impact and closure through tragedy. So like this book, while it's part of the series, like the first three books are really written for children and young, you know, children and young teens. But I matured in this, in, in the writing for a mature audience as they were growing up. And I thought, you know what, the audience can handle this. There are children dealing with losing their homes right now, you know, that are living in their car with mom and dad or living in their camper because their, their home is gone. So I decided not to hold back. So it is, there is a huge tragedy at the end of the story. But what the tragedy does is bring a whole family together in a triumph. And I have had such an incredible response to that book from people on an emotional level that said, you know, I read your book and we just lost our house and I wasn't expecting it, I'm a horse lover. And they said like, I've had to give up my horses because we have nothing. And your book really gave me courage. I'm tearing up myself because it's happened a few times. Yeah. And I think sometimes for the, not just for the sake of the story, but the sake of your readers and your characters, sometimes you have to dare to be different and break trope for the sake of the story and to give the readers uh, an experience, a reading experience. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, the the tearjerkers are the ones that you remember more mm. than the ones that 
and I write comedy. So, you know, I totally understand <laughs> that. Um, yeah. But yeah, the, the, the ones that the stories that that break your heart are the ones that you yeah. carry with yeah. you much longer yeah. than the ones that made you laugh, unfortunately. Uh, you know, but, I mean, I have I have others with with the traditional Walt Disney ending, you know, the hanky waving, get you know, yeah. wee cheering. I, I have others that are like that, but I think uh, I think sometimes the the story and characters will dictate the ending more than what you as mm. the writer had an yeah. idea in the first place. Yeah, I yeah, agree. I, I I agree. I agree. So there's there's um, I hear this all the time. Uh, your writer don't read your reviews. But I think that's bad advice. And I've said that to people too, don't read your reviews. But I think it's good to read your reviews because if you are missing the boat on anything, you know, if, if one person takes the time to give you a bad review, there were probably a hundred that didn't take the time to do that bad review for whatever the, the thing is that they didn't like. And if you see it multiple times, I think then that tells you something that you probably need to look at. I mean, how do you guys feel about reviews? Do, do you read them? Yeah, I, I do. And, you know, that, that's one reality of being an author. When you uh, put your creative self into the world for other people to read, it's, you know, it's, books are subjective. Either people are going to love it or they're not going to like it. And I think a lesson that I learned from speaking with other authors is like, uh, you can't please everyone, right? But I do think that when reviewers leave you have to put on the right hat and be in the right frame of mind when you go to read your reviews. You know, you have to shift out of author view and go into, you know, how is this going to improve my writing if there is a bad review there? Uh, or even the good reviews can improve your writing too. But, but how I look at it is I don't mind a negative review as long as the person has taken the time to um, be like provide a like, what was it that they had a hard time with? You know, for example, I, I had a, a you know, three-star review, which isn't even that bad, but the, the reviewer was very angry that my writers weren't wearing helmets um, in my books, you know? So, and, and so that's, you know, riding a helmet and protecting your head, that's important, really important to some people in the horse world, you know? But like, you know, this is a work of fiction, uh, you know, so, but in, in the Western sport, it, it has taken a little longer for people to embrace the wearing of a helmet, you know, instead of a cowboy hat, um, but it's slowly transitioning. So, so looking at things like that, you know, makes me conscious of what a, a reader would want, or, you know, should I include a helmet? And, you know, it gives me, and sometimes it gives me other things to think about to include in my follow-on books, like something was missing for someone, like, I wish I knew more about Devin's past or why doesn't she have a lot of friends that kind of thing so that that those elements help me weave it in so i think reading reviews are valuable but it's very important to take what you can accept leave what you can't and keep writing don't ever let a bad review stop you don't ever because you have to keep in mind you can't please everyone and it's so very subjective yeah i mean it's art you know some people mm -hmm. will look at a remember years ago that somebody painted uh, a, a blue stripe on a door with like red, a red stripe, and it sold for like a silly amount of money. <laughs> no, but to someone that was art, and to everybody else, <laughs> we're like, what the heck? I don't get it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, that's an extreme example. But yeah, with books, some people are going to like it, some people aren't. And you can't please everyone. Yeah. And, and do you, what do you think about reviews, Laura? Uh, I read all my reviews. Uh, I'm a lot like Carly, and I think uh, I've got the children's the children's books and the YA series that I write, you know, are um, I don't I are, are pretty much always four and five reviews and and a lot of times it's written by kids, you know, teens nice. teens or kids, and uh, every so often a re review touches my heart and I'll respond. Most of the time, ninety nine percent I don't. The adult books are a lot harder. The uh, you know you always get a lot I, I always range from one to five especially my black comedy it's a cozy mystery series it's a black comedy and i have a horse book out now for adults the silver spurs home for aging cowgirls mm -hmm. that is a dark it's it's really an adult book it's it's funny at times it's a mystery it, it's an adventure and it's a real 
it's a daring book for me because not everyone's going to like it. It's quite naughty is the best way to just describe mm -hmm. that. So I get a real gamut of reviews, you know, and they're usually ones or fives. <laughs> But I, and I don't mind the one-star reviews. I'm like, Harley, if they're, if they're providing criticism and uh, uh, constructive criticism, when you have no knowledge of, because, oh, I, don't, I didn't like it, right? right? And they put a one. That's when I have an issue with that. Because if I don't like a book, I'm not going to go review it and give it a one-star. It just wasn't my cup of tea. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I've had reviews where people have done a one star and they've said why and I've taken that to heart and I've actually done rewrites. I just finished rewriting that last book, The Silver Spurs. I did some rewrites based on some of the reviews because when I go back and look at it, I thought, you know what, they're right. I'm going to fix this. This will make me better. And I have an editor that, you know, that, that goes through. But the other thing, too, is, is I, I get a lot of people, especially with the, the gumboots ones, and I realized what happened and it took me about a year because I kept getting the same reviews about characters messed up in the book and I kept going through it and I talked to my editor and I talked to a few of my beta readers and they couldn't understand why I kept getting that review and then it dawned on me, one of the characters has a, uh, her name is, was Eliza Bone but her friends calls, called her Lizy. So I was switching sometimes between Eliza and Lizy, oh. and people were getting lost. Readers were getting lost. Okay. And it took me a year and a half to realize that, <laughs> what was going on. So I actually just went back in, and in all three books in the series where I go between Eliza and Eliza and Lizy, I got rid of Lizy and went back to Eliza straight, and I got rid of the nickname. So I don't nice. use nicknames unless I'm using them straight throughout a whole piece of work now. Yeah. Oh, that because, and, I mean, and that was the result of reading the same people giving me one and two star reviews saying the same thing, but I couldn't figure out where it was coming from, you know, rereading, rereading, then it don't, you know, and then just out of the blue, it's like, I know what's going on. <laughs> yeah. I've got a friend who's a romance author and, she got a, I think it might have been one, it was one or two star review where the person wrote, there's just too much sex. And she said that <laughs> boosted her sales a huge amount <laughs> because they put those bad reviews up above so you can see the best good review and the best bad review. She yeah. says as soon as that, that it's too much sex appeared, her sales just, uh, she said they probably, <laughs> probably bounced them by a third. Yeah, it's like, so, you know, that, you're right though. If, you're, if, you're, if you are a, a reader listening today, uh, please leave reviews for books that you buy because authors live and die from reviews. It's how other people find us and it's how we feel validated with those reviews. And if you don't like something, say why. Don't just yeah. say, and don't leave a review if Amazon didn't give you the book. I've seen people yeah. complaining about that. You know, Amazon didn't, leave, didn't give me the book. No, that has nothing to do with the author. Don't do that. Yeah. But yeah, if you don't like the book for a certain reason, say yeah. why. I like when authors will leave me a review and say, here's the pros, here's the cons. I'm like, ah, oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. Exactly. I can go through and read that and I know what to address. I had one, one review, I write cozy. And uh, what was it? that? The, oh, uh, in my first book, she has to team up with her arch nemesis. She hasn't speaking to him and spoken to him in 10 years. It's revealed in the book why she hasn't spoken to him. And I had somebody leave a three-star review that the, result, the reason why she hadn't spoken to him was just lame. And I laughed and laughed and I thought, that is perfect. So in the next book, she's explaining to someone why she hasn't talked to this person in 10 years. And they, mm. they tell her, you're so lame, it's so lame. And, I, and I, it was a great scene. And I wouldn't have gotten that scene if the person had not left that great review. Mm -hmm. So I was very pleased with that. Yeah. So this it's we've been going for about an hour. I hate to take all your whole day up. So <laughs> why don't you get both just quickly go through uh, and tell us where people can find you? I know for for you, Carly, you also do um, you also work with authors. You do coaching for authors. I do. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So go ahead and just run us down where we can find you and where if authors are listening and they'd like to be coached, how they can reach you. Absolutely. So uh, I'm Carly Cade. It's K-A-D-E. And you can find me at CarlyCadeCreative.com. Uh, and basically, you can get everywhere that I am from there. I'm on Facebook, Instagram, 
Pinterest. I have a YouTube channel where you can also listen to my Equestrian Author Spotlight podcast, which airs weekly. And we hear the behind the scenes of horse book authors, what inspired their books, how their horse, their love of horses began. You learn marketing tips, writing tips, all that great stuff. And the conversations are really fun. Uh, and then I also offer creativity coaching where I work with authors uh, around basically how to write faster and more often and get their projects done, whether it's your first book or your 50th, uh, you know, whether you're looking to get a book finished or promote the one that you've already written, I offer services to help that. And you can get there from carlycadecreative.com. So perfect, perfect. And, and uh, if you're listening and you like that uh, pre-order that you talked about, it's eight books, eight equine books, all different, mm -hmm. different things. Uh, we'll have a link to that in the show notes too, because that sounded good. So Laura, where can people find you? Um, you can find me on my website, which is also my blog site uh, at uh, www.runninglproductions.com and on Amazon around the world. Uh, I, um, I urge everybody actually to sign up for Carly's newsletter. She's got the greatest news. I don't do newsletters, but she's got, she's got everything. She does all sorts of stuff with the, the equine world too. And from singing and videos, it's, it's fabulous. I, I love her uh, e-newsletters. E uh, but me, I'm strictly on Amazon right now, Facebook. Amazon, Facebook, BookBub, uh, you can contact, you know, uh, find out about my work through, but, or like I said, mostly through my website. Um, right. I don't do the newsletter thing because I'm uh, right now I'm booked for about seven months for narrator's work. Mm -hmm. I've got um, I've got two authors that I'm doing some books for them. Plus, I have all my own and I'm trying to get out a tr Christmas book in between. So I just, you know, I kind of ha had to narrow it down. So I, I used to do do newsletters and updates. Now I just, you know, what, once or twice a month, I'll put out some information on what's coming out, what's going on. Uh, kind of thing. But if you want to do new releases, you can follow me on Amazon if you want to find out about my new releases and work or follow me on my blog or on Facebook uh, is the best thing. Okay, great. And I will have links in the show notes. All you have to do is drop down and click on that uh, on the, the show notes there. If you have any comments for today's show, just go down to the show notes. Like I said, there'll be the comment. It'll take you over to the YouTube channel if you're listening on the podcast and you can comment there. So I want to thank you both for coming on today. It was really oh, interesting. You. Genre I didn't know anything about. Thank yeah, you so there we much, go. Melissa. Yeah, thank you very much. It's been fun and nice to see you again, Carly. Oh, absolutely, Laura. I can't wait to have you on my show in a couple of weeks. Yeah, later. yeah. Oh, no, I won't have this big black thing in front of my face then. <laughs> well, authors unite. Thank you so yeah, much. Definitely. It was fun. <laughs> Take care, ladies. Thanks, ladies. You will find everything we talked about down in the show notes. If you have a book that I need to read, please let me know. If you've written a book that I need to read, let me know. I have my email included. I started including that. I think it's bookscube.info at gmail, but it'd be down in the show notes. So just click on that and let me know. I'm also on Instagram. You can find me there. So that's it for this week. I will see you next week with another great show. In the meantime, go read a good book. Mm -hmm.